Okay, everyone. Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. We thank you for being here with us in today's webinar. Uh, the Faculty of Engineering at Universidad de Santiago de Chile, with the support of the Engagement and External Affairs Division and its Office for International Relations, with the collaboration of the University of Saskatchewan, Canada, is pleased to have you here today to be part of the webinar New Perspectives on Wastewater Treatment. Today's session is a result of the collaboration and a strategic alliance between our Department of Chemical Engineering at Universidad de Santiago and the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering at University of Saskatchewan, Canada. We thank in advance the participation of our speakers, Dr. Jafar Sultan, Professor and Graduate Chair of the Chemical Engineering at the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering at University of Saskatchewan, Canada, and Dr. Cesar Willinir, Head of the Master in Environmental Engineering with a specialization in Waste Treatment Engineering at Universidad de Santiago de Chile. And of course, our moderator, Mrs. Ana Karen Botana de la Cruz, Master of Science Chemical Engineering from the University of Saskatchewan, Canada. Thank you again, and please enjoy this webinar. I, I give you the word now to Ana Karen. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us. Um, I'm going to give a brief introduction about what this webinar is going to be talking about. Uh, I'm also going to address any questions you may have after both presentations are done. Um, I can address both questions in English and Spanish. I'm bilingual, so you can uh, feel free and to throw your questions in Spanish, and then I will be translating for our panelists to address them. Water is by far the most valuable resource we have. With the world drastically changing environmentally and the world population continuously growing, we have to find better ways to make the most of our resources. Wastewater is a product of water used in houses, industries, and many other activities. Its treatment is crucial for it to be returned and disposed in a safety manner. Today, we will hear the research that is being done to assess this treatment. I would now like to give the word to Dr. Jafar Sultan. Thank you, Anna Karina, for your kind introduction. Uh, I would like to share my screen and, uh, and give a brief introduction uh, about our university, our program, uh, and uh, a little bit about the research that is done on uh, water and wastewater treatment uh, in our research group. Okay, uh, just let me make sure. Yes, uh, a few words about uh, University of Saskatchewan. Uh, we are sitting in, in Saskatchewan, somewhere in the middle of Canada. And uh, this is uh, the first university uh, of the province about 110 years ago that was uh, established. Uh, we have uh, different programs from arts, social sciences, engineering, to health sciences and law in our university. We have a very beautiful campus with uh, some uh, very classical buildings and some very modern looking buildings. Uh, and our university is a member of U15 in Canada. Uh, U15 are 15 universities with very intense research program in a wide range of areas, including uh, medical sciences. Uh, a few numbers about university. Uh, we have around 26,000 students. Uh, more than 10% are international students uh, from around 132 countries. Uh, and we have uh, around 3,300 self-declared indigenous students. These were people that were living in this land well before the settlers came uh, from, uh, from Europe and other parts of the world. Uh, some of the research infrastructure in the university, uh, I have listed them here. Uh, 
One of them is the Canadian light source. This is the uh, synchrotron in Canada, the only synchrotron in Canada that is within walking distance from our campus. Uh, from our building, it takes six, seven minutes to walk to synchrotron. Uh, this is a very valuable uh, resource for us in terms of uh, material characterization and studies. And we have a very good working relationship with them. A lot of the scientists are on our students' advisory committees, and they advise us in characterizing material and identifying the fine structure of chemicals. Uh, we have also a global institute for water security uh, in our university, uh, a big investment on upstream water resources, everything from precipitation to runoffs, everything. Uh, we have Structural Sciences Center uh, in our university. This is a central research facility that has a lot of uh, large scale and uh, expensive uh, research tools that uh, are really too expensive or too complicated for any specific research group to have in their lab. So they have everything under one roof and we kind of uh, get service from uh, their expertise and the equipment. Uh, we have a toxicology research center uh, that is again, one of the best in the world, uh, focusing on different aspects of technology uh, that impact the quality of water and air and soil. Uh, they have very good infrastructure and facility in terms of analytical chemistry and uh, toxicity analysis of water and wastewater. Now we have Environment Canada within, again, walking distance from us. We have Innovation Place. Uh, this is more like an incubator to take the research from university to a real world application. And of course, these days, uh, it is uh, on top of the news, we have Video Intervac. Uh, this is uh, an international facility supported through the government grants and part of the university uh, that works on development of vaccines and, uh, and kind of these days, their research is very relevant because they are testing uh, a vaccine that they have developed. I think it's phase two or phase three that is going on. And, and they are expanding their facilities to expand their uh, vaccine manufacturing facilities these days. Uh, I am from the Department of Chemical and Biological Engineering. So I, I want to say a few words about our College of Engineering. Uh, basically, our college has uh, four main uh, departments, chemical and biological engineering, civil geological, environmental engineering, electrical and computer engineering, and mechanical engineering. And in our department, we have uh, four branches of petroleum, uh, biotechnology, biological, and mining and mineral processing. So th th our students can take some specialty courses in these areas and, and they become more knowledgeable in different technologies of, uh, related to these four sectors of industry. And uh, this is a, an icon in our department. Uh, if you walk up, of course, these days we are working remotely, but if you walk through our uh, department, uh, you may uh, come across uh, Dr. Peng. Uh, this is, uh, if in chemical engineering thermodynamics, we have always used Peng Robinson equation of state, and he is the Peng of that Peng Robinson. Uh, he teaches uh, thermodynamics and advanced thermodynamics, and uh, he's a good fellow with a lot of uh, contribution in our field. Uh, our head of department is Dr. Nemati. I'm serving as graduate chair and my colleague Dr. New is working as undergraduate chair. Uh, a few just keywords uh, about different research areas in our uh, department. Uh, we have a wide range of research topics. 
uh, in our department from reaction engineering to catalysis, biological engineering, biochemical, biofuels, bioprocessing. Uh, our province has a strong uh, agriculture uh, industry. So a lot of bioresource related research is done in our department. We have a strong mining and mineral processing as well. So we have a strong research program on corrosion, fertilization, and also environmental engineering. Now, when it comes to research on water and wastewater, uh, I should mention that there are a number of uh, departments and programs university that contribute to research in water and wastewater. Uh, of course, in our college, we have colleagues in chemical engineering and also colleagues in civil geological and environmental engineering that work on water and wastewater related research. Uh, we, I, I will give a brief introduction about the kind of research that we do in our department. Uh, we have, a, uh, a school of environment and sustainability. And again, a big component of their activities, environment and water and wastewater treatment. Uh, we have uh, a toxicology research center, as I mentioned, again, more than half of their research uh, infrastructure and expertise is focused on water and wastewater. And of course, we have colleagues in the department of chemistry uh, that uh, do have research on uh, developing advanced materials for water and wastewater treatment. So really, we always have this potential of collaboration outside our program to relate to other people and uh, create stronger teams for research on water and wastewater. Now, when it comes to uh, my research, uh, I work uh, in the area of environmental catalysis. And basically we have focused on two areas of water pollution and air pollution. Um, air pollution these days uh, is becoming concerned because of the COVID and the fact that viruses uh, transmit through air. So uh, we use uh, catalysts and catalytic processes for treatment of air. Uh, to get rid of organic pollutants. And also uh, now we have expanded to uh, pathogens in air. So that is a different story. Maybe another time we can talk about this. Uh, but in water treatment, uh, we have focused mostly on emerging pollutants. Really why we call these emerging pollutants because you know, these are new products. 100 years ago, people were using mostly natural products, uh, and really we didn't have concern with these chemicals. But now with, uh, with progress in our lifestyle and, and hygiene and modernity and all the new products that we have, now we are dealing with the new class of pollutants that we have to uh, try to somehow address them. Now, what are these emerging pollutants? This is uh, a list of some of these emerging pollutants, uh, residuals from pesticides, for example, personal care products, pharmaceuticals, antibiotics. Uh, imagine, you know, next time that you want to use your shampoo, uh, take a look at the ingredients of the shampoo and maybe Google a couple of these chemicals. You see that these are typically uh, chemicals, uh, although they have very small concentration, but th the point is that mostly they are not biodegradable. And what happens is that when we are using this uh, shampoo, for example, you know, the wastewater that goes through the wastewater treatment plant, uh, really the wastewater treatment process is mostly biological process. So you have bio treatment, you have microbes that get rid of the chemicals. But of course, if you have a chemical that is toxic or not biodegradable, really it is not consumed by microbes. So it ends up in river. That is why this is a, a new issue. That's why we call them emerging pollutants. And they are really coming from 
uh, all sorts of activities and products from you know pesticides that we use for agriculture industry, uh, pharmaceuticals, birth control pills or, or antibiotics. Uh, we will have a couple of words about antibiotics as well. To household cleaning items uh, for chemicals that we use in uh, manufacturing plastics and polymers. So if you count them, really, we have thousands and thousands of these chemicals, including, for example, around 900 uh, pesticides uh, ingredients, uh, or around two, 3,000 uh, formulation ingredients, industrial chemicals, cosmetics. All these things are really uh, chemicals that we didn't have them 100 years ago. But nowadays, we use them in our everyday products, and we have to deal with the consequences of the accumulation in nature. Uh, this is a kind of a schematic of really how this whole uh, emerging pollutants cycle is. Basically, the wastewater that comes from houses and our activities goes through wastewater treatment process, but because the, the heart of wastewater treatment process is biological treatment. And typically these chemicals are not biodegradable. Really, they end up in river and they keep accumulating and adding up in river and really at the end become our drinking water. This is a, antibiotics is a different uh, kind of class of emerging pollutants. Uh, just a few uh, numbers and words about them. Uh, Antibiotics that are produced in the world, less than 20% are for human use, but more than 80% are for animal use. Uh, typically, they use these antibiotics uh, to prevent you know, animals getting sick, or if they get sick, to treat them. And, and sometimes they add them to the animal feed uh, to increase the weight gain. So that is kind of the problem. Now, what happens is that these antibiotics are not completely metabolized in body. So part of these antibiotics really pass through the body, mostly through urine, for example, and they end up in nature. So you have antibiotics end up in nature. What it causes, it causes antibiotic resistance. That is the bacteria that kind of can get used to the presence of these antibiotics they become stronger and stronger and, and more prevalent. And really at the end, your antibiotic loses effectiveness. So uh, that is a, a serious concern. Uh, this is a kind of, a, a, uh, again, the kind of path that these antibiotics end up in, uh, in river or in nature, basically. Uh, antibiotics that humans use they, they go to wastewater treatment plant and the solid waste from wastewater treatment plant is used as an agricultural uh, additive or uh, additive to soil, like soil conditioner. And the same with uh, animal use, basically antibiotics that are excreted from the animals, they end up as manure and then uh, they are added to soil as as again, soil conditioner or kind of soil additive. And really when the rain comes, rain washes away these antibiotics from soil to river, or they just stay in the soil and they kind of uh, increase that, that resistance uh, of, of, uh, of microbes. So we have these two issues of, of antibiotics and emerging pollutants. And really, they are either released to nature from point sources, for example, wastewater treatment plant, you know, at the end of wastewater treatment process, you have these chemicals that are not degraded, so they end up in river, or you have distributed sources, that is, you know, this runoff from soil, and leachate from soil that end up in river. Uh, of course, in terms of treatment, probably point source treatment is more direct and easier because you have a higher concentration available for treatment. 
Now, there are a lot of treatment methods for these chemicals in nature uh, and in industry. What we have focused we have focused more on advanced oxidation processes. And of course, each of these has their own advantages and disadvantages. Uh, imagine advanced oxidation process in a wastewater treatment plant. Uh, you can apply it after the primary treatment, or you can apply it uh, as part of a tertiary treatment process. And each of these options have their own advantages and disadvantages. Uh, typically in my lab, we have focused more on catalytic ozonation. We have different kinds of reactors that we use. We develop the catalyst uh, with different geometries and we try uh, catalytic processes and advanced ozonation pro oxidation processes uh, with these ozone. This is a, a list of some of the advantages of ozone. Basically, it has been used a lot in different industries for more than 100 years. It has a strong uh, oxidation potential. Uh, and it can oxidize a lot of chemicals, break a lot of uh, bonds uh, in terms of these emerging pollutants. Uh, typically, ozone has a wide range of applications from air to water treatment for food industries and bleaching and everything. So in terms of use and application, ozone is a kind of established chemical. And of course, it has its own challenges because it's in gas phase, it has low solubility in water and it has its own toxicity. And of course, cost because you have to produce it from oxygen. Reactions of ozone uh, have uh, a number of paths. Uh, one path is simple reaction of ozone with pollutants. Another path is uh, the path that takes you ozone, produces uh, active radicals, and these active radicals are even stronger than ozone itself, so they react with uh, pollutants. Uh, and this is the path that really becomes advanced oxidation process. You can use ozone with other additives like hydrogen peroxide, UV, or catalyst to promote that advanced oxidation process. Uh, this is a kind of schematic of a typical experimental setup in our lab. We use oxygen to produce ozone, and then that ozone reacts uh, with the pollutant, and we can kind of measure concentration of ozone in gas phase, in liquid phase, and log this data for kinetic studies and things like that. I just want to share you uh, one research uh, that was done a while ago, and we were using atrazine uh, as, a, as a pesticide uh, that is used in agriculture industry. Uh, atrazine in nature has a lot of issues. It is used widely. It can cause reproductive and development issues in animals and, and humans as well. Uh, and we kind of uh, determine the rate of reaction of removal of atrazine in this catalytic process that, that we had. This is just one sample uh, of the kind of research and, and findings that we have. But of course, we have a wide range of extension of this research. I want to kind of uh, conclude with this slide that this is work in progress. We want to uh, use this research and expand it with trying with different water matrices, you know, mixtures of different micropollutants, uh, and also toxicity studies, you know, what are the products of these reactions if they are less or more toxic. And another branch of our work focuses on antibiotics. Uh, we work on uh, selective adsorbents for removal of uh, antibiotics from wastewater. Uh, and at the end, uh, this is a pre-COVID picture from our research group. Some of the members that were present on that rainy spring day. And I just wanted to add uh, uh, a word of appreciation to a few past members of our group uh, that contributed to this research in water area. 
and of course funding agencies and collaborators uh, in our research. Uh, with that, I want to thank you for your kind attention and uh, end my presentation. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sultan, for your presentation. Now we would like to give the floor to Dr. Cesar Wilmir. Thank you very much, Anna Karen. And um, thank you, everyone. Um, my name is Cesar Wilmir Curio, and um, I would like to talk with you today. Let me, okay, now it's much better. Once again, um, hello everyone, good morning, good uh, afternoon. Um, um, I would like to talk with you today about some advances in biological wastewater treatment. This, the, this topic is, um, uh, is um, uh, developing around the world, of course, and, and uh, today I, I, I will serve, I will uh, show you some aspect of the biological wastewater treatment that is uh, available uh, currently. First of all, of course, present my my university, the University of Santiago de Chile. Uh, we have uh, uh, twenty three thousand undergraduate students, and um, very close to the University of. Uh, um, Saskatchewan and uh, 2,000 uh, more or less graduate students in uh, 56 programs mm -hmm. around. Uh, our ranking, um, Chile, we are the third, the third one, uh, and in Latin America, we are in the place 14. So uh, we are in the five percent. Uh, of the best university in Latin America. Uh, recently, the university was uh, accredited uh, by seven years, how you can see here. But this is a very good news for us because uh, only three, four now, uh, university here in Chile has that level of accreditation. So we are very happy with this news. Um, about the uh, Faculty of Engineering here in the University of Santiago de Chile. Uh, we have 14 areas of specialization, uh, among them uh, chemical engineering, uh, metallurgical engineering, um, biotechnology engineering, and of course, environmental engineering. Um, in our department, in the chemical engineering department, we have chemical and biotechnology engineering. Um, we have more or less uh, 15 graduate programs between master and the PhD program. Our department, the chemical engineering department has uh, uh, two um, programs, uh, master programs, one in chemical engineering and another one in environmental engineering applied to the um, treatment of uh, what waste in general. The other program is a PhD in a process engineering, and this is together with the Department of Mechanical Engineering and Metallurgical Engineering. Okay, more or less, that is the general view of our university and our faculty uh, right now. And um, about the topic, a problem here, at least uh, for me, um, organic waste. The question now is this kind of waste are really a waste or a source of resources? And uh, as you will see now, the, the world and the society and scientists are changing and uh, are changing the vision of the treatment of wastewater. And now the, this kind of waste are a source of valuable compounds. And uh, that is the, that the main idea that I would like to uh, sh share with you. 
uh, it's not uh, just a waste, it's a source of resources. And um, the, the famous uh, circular economy is based in that view. Uh, regarding the wastewater, the municipal wastewater treated here in Chile now is around 100%. The change uh, or the increasing was done in the last uh, 20 years, especially since the 2000. Uh, that was possible because the, 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 the government create a new uh, norm in order to improve the uh, wastewater treatment uh, in all the country. So uh, regarding to um, industrial wastewater, the situation is similar. There are a lot of industry with its own um, uh, um, wastewater treatment processes. Uh, basically, what is the structure of the, the, the wastewater treatment? As uh, the professor Sultan said before, just a little bit uh, about the, the process. Um, the first one is the, the removed of the, the big, big solid. And after that, the smaller solid is retired in the primary clarifier. After that, the bi biological treatment, the hair of the, uh, the, the wastewater treatment. And normally, is, um, this is based in the activated sludge process who is an aerobic process where the um, organic matter, nitrogen and phosphorus is used for the growth of a biomass. And this biomass is retired or eliminated here in the second clarifier, okay? Primary sludge and the secondary sludge is uh, then uh, treated through a very standard technology called anaerobic digestion. And uh, the main advantage of this anaerobic digestion is the production of biogas, uh, who is the a mixing of methane and uh, CO2 or dioxide, carbon dioxide. After that, the last part of the treatment is uh, the disinfection. And then the water is ready for reuse or for uh, go to a, uh, natural body water, like river or, or lake, okay? This is the classical overview. But the same situation can be now read as uh, a biofactory. And indeed here in Chile, maybe the student of the uh, University of Santiago de Chile and other uh, students here in Santiago uh, know that the Aguas Andinas change its name. Now Aguas Andinas is a biofactory. And why a biofactory? Because now, according to, to the, the last research, the uh, wastewater is a resource. Resource of what? Of all of these compounds. This is a picture of uh, a paper from Pujol et al. Um, and um, you can see here several compounds that you can obtain from wastewater. I would like to uh, focus on two, just two. And uh, biogas, of course, uh, and uh, phosphorus recovery through estrobite and uh, ammonia recovery and ammonia treatment, okay? That is, um, even though is a uh, standard technology. Not all the, the wastewater treatment plant has some uh, uh, kind of uh, recovery of energy or fertilizer through these two steps. So um, I would like to show you some aspects about these two compounds. Of course, there are many other things such as uh, single cell proteins, basis food, biodiesel from lipids, raw bioplastic, very important, metals, biochar, if you need something for uh, absorption, as you say with the professor Sultan. The biogas, standard technology, once again, very old technology, but very useful. 
um, this kind of uh, technology um, can you can be used in the treatment of uh, sea west sludge as you can see now and uh, also uh, for um, wastewater with high load i mean industrial wastewater coming from agroindustry um, the um, uh, another kind of wastewater um, industrial wastewater for specifically municipal uh, wastewater the anaerobic membrane bioreactors are developing in some uh, countries specifically in span spain uh, there are several uh, groups um, studying this technology and of course in the netherlands and the uh, united states so probably in the future also the municipal wastewater could be treated through this technology anaerobic digestion the main advantage once again is the production of biogas or methane the biogas needs to be clean uh, after the production of course in order to retire the co2 co2 and others uh, gas compounds uh, so um Nutrient recovery, that could be interesting for the new generation. This, um, this um, graphic or plot uh, you can see here is remaining phosphate rock reserves. So the phosphorus is a non-renewable uh, uh, um, compound. Um, currently, we are close to the top of the uh, remaining phosphate rock. So after that, in 2014, more or less, the reserves will decrease and then new sources of phosphorus um, uh, are necessary. Uh, uh, in this case, the wastewater can be effectively an, uh, an a source of recovery of phosphorus and, of course, nitrogen and another kind of things like sulfur, okay? What is the main problem now with nitrogen and phosphorus? That these uh, compounds uh, generate eutrophication. And the eutrophication, as we know, the generation of too much algae and uh, the depletion or depletion of, uh, or decreasing of the oxygen in body, body, body waters. So uh, how we can recover, I'm sorry if you, feel some screen my, my kids um, what can we do with the, the phosphorus and nitrogen well and the phosphorus specifically and also with the nitrogen the strobite production can be one of the options and maybe the best option uh, right now uh, in order to recover phosphorus the, the, the phosphorus also can be recovered through the growth of biomass but it's more complicated to 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 use it uh, this um, therefore the the advantage of the production of estrobite is that you can control it in uh, in a, a reactor in order to produce uh, just estrobite like this in the picture uh, currently the estrobite is a naturally formated in um, in the wastewater treatment plants in the piping as you can see here so now is a problem but also it's a really good opportunity in order to recover the phosphorus and then produce a very good fertilizer okay um, ah, one of things that you need to keep in mind is that the production of estrobite has the problem of magnesium normally uh, nitrogen and phosphorus coming uh, in, in, in the wastewater, but uh, magnesium, no. So you need a, a new source or sources of magnesium in order to produce the estrobite. And also you need some uh, operational conditions such as pH, temperature close to the optimum. And uh, that optimum is different sometimes of the, the biological process, for instance. Um, what happened with the nitrogen? The nitrogen, you have two options now. You can recover it through, the, uh, through several uh, uh, technologies available, or you can treat it. 
um, the current situation that is the production of ammonia or fertilizer through Haberbosch process and its removal through biological process is still cheaper than the recovery of nitrogen in terms of energy and money. Okay, so it is still um, necessary the removal of nitrogen that is not a very is not a bad new I mean it's, it's just the fact that biological process applied to the remo removal of nitrogen is still necessary in, in wastewater treatment plant. What are the processes related to this removal of nitrogen? There are two uh, mainly uh, nitrification in, and denitrification. This is conventional very famous in the area of uh, wastewater treatment plants. And now since uh, 2000, more or less, uh, partial nitrification, nitrification, sorry, and the Animox process uh, is available at industrial scale, okay? Uh, there are plants in, uh, in Europe, in the Netherlands, and uh, currently here in uh, Chile also is, uh, is uh, applying the Animox process in order to tra treat the, the very high concentration of ammonia. Um, well, nitrification and denitrification and also Animox are shown here in this nitrogen cycle. The normal, the conventional process is uh, take the ammonia and oxidize to nitrite, okay? And after that, the nitrate is oxidized to nitrate. All these steps are called uh, nitrification. It's an aerobic and it's an aerobic process, aerobic with oxygen. Uh, and um, that's uh, that's the main problem. You need oxygen, and the oxygen is expensive and very hard to uh, put inside the water. After that, the nitrate that also is a uh, pollutants, uh, you need to reduce it uh, to nitrogen, uh, molecular nitrogen, through denitrification. Denitrification, normally you can uh, perform it through the heterotrophic denitrification with organic matter, the cheapest, uh, the cheapest uh, source of uh, this kind of, this uh, organic matter is the methanol normally, but also you can use uh, um, another kind of uh, organic matter, um, you know, uh, uh, acetic acid, or even the raw wastewater can be used as a source of uh, organic matter for denitrification. De and what about the Animox, the famous Animox? Animox is uh, a process that uh, to allow reduce the quantity of oxygen because the ammonia is just oxidized until uh, nitrite and then the anamox, the anaerobic oxidation of ammonia um, can transform ammonia and nitrite to nitrogen. This reduces the quantity of oxygen that is necessary for the treatment of um, uh, nitrogen. So this is the main advantage of the anamox process. Okay, is a, a, um, a very interesting process and now available at industrial scale. Okay, I don't know how much, I think uh, it's very shortly, uh, some gaps in wastewater treatment has the professor Sultan says, uh, uh, micropollutants are one of them. As you can see here in this picture coming from the paper of Kumbwimba and Meng, um, and there are several sources of uh, these compounds in laboratory wastewater, industrial wastewater, uh, hospitals, and so on. Uh, can you hear me? It's a, yes? Okay. So it's a problem with my computer. Um, well, all, all of these compounds, um, such as ibuprofen, diclofenac, or antibiotics it must be eliminated, but unfortunately in the normal wastewater treatment plants cannot be reduced. 
and uh, in this case the AOPS that uh, our the professor Sultan says can be used in order to reduce this compound. Um, the, the, the step of nitrification also can reduce these compounds. It is still in develop uh, and the, what uh, are the rate of degradation of biological degradation of these compounds, but it is possible through um, the bio biological processes related to nitrogen removal uh, also remove this kind of micropollutants, maybe not so fast like an AOP, but uh, it's still a good idea to try to reduce in the biological uh, way. And the, the last one is, is, uh, is, is, is about the nitrous oxide generation in wastewater treatment plants. This compound is a gaseous compound and um, is a very hard uh, problem in terms of greenhouse and uh, how greenhouse uh, gases. Um, it has uh, the warming power of 300 uh, molecules of carbon dioxide. And unfortunately, is produced in the normal cycle of nitrogen in, in both steps, in the aerobic steps through the ammonia oxidizing bacteria. In this part, the uh, hydroxylamine is, uh, is the pathway in where the uh, nitrous oxide is produced. And in the heterotrophic denitrification, denitrification, sorry, also can be produced through the, um, these um, enzymatic steps where also the nitrous oxide can be released to the gas phase together with, for instance, the molecular nitrogen. Uh, this aspect can be reduced, of course, the production can be reduced, but you need to control very well the oxygen and, and other parameters in wastewater treatment plants in order to reduce, in order to control the emissions of this very complicated uh, greenhouse gas. So, um, in conclusion, um, energy and nutrients, uh, nutrients sorry, are possible to recover from wastewater. So, wastewater is not just waste, it's a new resource. Please think about it. Uh, anaerobic digestion and phosphorus recovery through estropite precipitation are processes currently available and um, Nitrogen reduction is still necessary, as you can see, uh, after now, uh, until now, uh, because uh, economic uh, aspect. And finally, micropollutants and nitrous oxide are still uh, problems in the wastewater treatment, and uh, new developments are necessary in order to control and reduce these compounds in our plants wastewater treatment plants. So uh, thank you very much for your attention. Uh, comments and questions are welcome. Thank you, Ana Karen. Thank you, Dr. Cesar and Dr. Sultan for your presentations. Um, we already have a couple of questions here. Uh, the first ones, or the first one was from YouTube, and it was addressed while Dr. Sultan was giving its presentation. So the question is coming from Freddy Valdez, and it has the accumulation of pollutants been detected in aquatic fauna after the discharge of the treated effluent to the receiving water body? Uh, yes, it, this is a very important issue. Uh, Around the world, there are a lot of research groups that are doing analysis uh, of surface water and water bodies. And it seems that almost all of them indicate that, yes, we are seeing increasing levels of these chemicals, not only in terms of the number of these chemicals, but also the amount of these chemicals. So really, this is, this is a concerning issue that we are in, like in a, in a chemical engineering term, we are accumulating these chemicals in nature and that will make 
uh, availability of the clean water resources less and less for us and for future generations. Yes, there is evidence that these chemicals are accumulating. That's why we have to do something about them. Thank you, Dr. Sultan. Dr. Sisa, would you like to add anything to the question? <laughs> no, the, 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 the question is more or less clear with the response of our colleagues. Okay, we'll move on to the next question that we got is from Sebastian Herrera. How much energy is required for the operation of a wastewater treatment plant and how much greenhouse emissions are generated for the operation of the wastewater treatment plant? To whom? Dr. Oh, Sosa? I think it can be addressed to both of you. So whoever wants to answer. Oh, good question. Um, well, um, the amount uh, it depends. I think I have. I, I don't. I don't have. It seems like Dr. Cesar froze in there. Um, Dr. Sultan, would you like to? My connection is unstable. Oh, there you go. <laughs> we are good. Yeah, go on, please. Yes. Yeah. Well, um, I, I, as, um, I don't have the, the number, exactly the number, uh, but uh, more or less the nitrous, nitrous oxide represent more than 50% of uh, greenhouse, total greenhouse in exceeding the, um, the methane and CO2. But I, I don't have the, the, the number now. So I, I, maybe Jafar can help me, but then the, I don't yeah. have the, the, yeah. the uh, uh, th This is a very interesting question. And really, yeah. it, the amount of greenhouse gases that are produced varies over a wide range, depending on the type of wastewater that we are receiving and also the type of treatment that we are doing. Actually, I have one colleague here in our university. We are working together. He is in civil uh, environmental engineering. engineering. And one just recent PhD research that is completing is analysis of these chemicals, these gases that are released uh, because Typically, our wastewater treatment plant operates at lower temperature because of colder winters compared to a typical plant in Chile, for example. And the type of gases and the amount of gases, greenhouse gases that are produced will be different. So this is the top it is doing to quantify the type of chemicals and their amount. Uh, if you can send me an email, uh, I, I can uh, give you the more recent publications from the student that is really the most up-to-date. That kind of applies to northern climate, more cold conditions. Whereas if you have a warmer environmental conditions, the composition would be very different. Unfortunately, yes. <laughs> yeah, and uh, regarding to energy... Uh, yes, um, but it depends. It's not. Uh, it's not in general because uh, it depends. Municipal wastewater treatment with um, activated sludge with aerobic process. The more or less. Well, it depends the time. The, the, the process. But uh, oh, what what number? I have one kilowatt by. Uh, kilogram of DO, DOD oxidized, more or less. This is the the the, the magnitude of the, the the energy, but depends on depends on the, the type of process, anaerobic or aerobic. Thank you for your answers. I hope the question was addressed. So next question is from Sofia Rodriguez. Has a nanomaterial, this is for Dr. Cesar, has a nanomaterial been used to remove sulfur from water? And no, the sulfur is uh, normally is uh, 
eliminate it through a chemical precipitation normally. Um, you can use um, uh, salt of uh, iron, iron salt in order to precipitate the sulfur and then the solid or the sludge is removed. Um, another way is through a biological process, but it's still under research because uh, the cycle of sulfur is quite complicated. So normally the main idea is to try to do uh, or try to produce uh, elemental sulfur. Okay, and the elemental sulfur is an intermediate of the oxidation of sulfide to elemental sulfur and then sulfate. And, and, and um, at least the main idea of recovered sulfur is try to produce the elemental sulfur that can be used as a fertilizer. So um, it's a mixing of processes. And then normally, in order to retire the sulfide, you can use uh, um, um, iron salt in order to precipitate. Thank you for your answer, Dr. Sister. Uh, Ricardo Abejón would like to know Dr. Sultan's opinion in the use of advanced membrane reactors, more specifically the catalytic and enzymatic membranes for the treatment of emerging pollutants. Yes. Uh, uh, the interesting point is that right now we have the problem. We know that we have these emerging pollutants. We don't have a final solution yet. So really different possible technologies, you know, advanced oxidation, membrane reactors, you no know, biological reactors, advanced membrane reactors. These are all possibilities and they are all in research stage. So yeah, this would be a, a, a catalytic membrane reactor. I can think of potential advantages in treating these waters or enzymatic membranes, for example. Yeah, they are all possibilities and very interesting ideas to explore. Yes, thank you for your answer, Dr. Sultan. We're gonna move to some of the questions that we got from the chat now, because. Lots of people have been yeah, asking I can, questions. I can, I can read some questions. Dr. Christian Antileo says, uh, energy consumption for activated sludge processes around uh, 0 0.3 to 0 0.6 kilowatt hour for um, per, sorry, a cubic meter of water, wastewater treated. Yeah. And you can see in the chat, and um, another question here, very interesting question. I'm um, sorry, Anna Karen, Anna Karen. You, you, you oh. are, <laughs> you, you are the, the, sorry, sorry. Yeah, I'm just gonna translate this question from Vanessa Palomo. Uh, in function with the effectiveness to fabricate fertilizers with uh, the re recovered products such as nitrogen and phosphorus, which one are the advantages when we compare with the current fertilizers that are in the market. And in terms of cost, is this recovery uh, already being managed as an alternative in industries? Yes, uh, nice question. Thank you. Um, well, it's not the, the, the big issue is not the quality of the fertilizers. Indeed, the problem is how we can recover and use phosphorus, nitrogen, and sulfur uh, and try to close the, the circle and, uh, and then to produce or not to uh, uh, spend a lot of money producing, for instance, nitrogen and then put in, in into the environment. So the quality of the fertilizer is not the point. The fertilizer will be, of course, a good fertilizer, maybe not so good that the chemical production, but the point of view is to recovery and use it um, in, 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 the, in the land. Um, probably uh, uh, regarding to cost, uh, the struvite precipitation is currently available. So it's uh, competitive in terms of cost and then you can use it. And there are some examples in, I think in, in the Netherlands that they use the municipal wastewater as a source of 
phosphate, phosphorus in order to produce the, the estrovite. And also there are other kind of uh, compounds like uh, bivianite and bivianite, I think, that also can be produced. So um, the production are available and the costs are competitive in terms or comparing to the classical uh, fertilizer industry. Thank you, Dr. Willinie. Now we're gonna move for a question that was addressed to Dr. Sultan. This is from Magdalena. She's a PhD student uh, in Spain, but she's from the University of Santiago de Chile where she did her bachelor's in chemical engineering. So this question is towards the area of agri-food industrial wastewater. Uh, which technologies would you recommend to use in let me just get familiar with this term, in the small and medium um, size, I'm guessing um, industrial or in situ where large streams of wastewater are generated with a high organic load and valuable compounds like phenolic compounds, taking into account that the objective is to recover the compounds and the water source with the disadvantage that the companies do not have uh, the large space to take for these processes take place. Yeah, this is a very interesting uh, situation. As I understand, we have uh, an SMB, small medium enterprise, and they are focused on the agri-food industries uh, and they have a wastewater that is rich in some compounds and, and of course they have limited space. I tell you this, this situation is very similar to a lot of companies in Saskatchewan. The only difference is the environment because here we have typically colder climate and probably if you are talking about an industry in Spain, they have slightly warmer climate. I would say depending on what material we have or what materials we have in wastewater and what limitations they have uh, the kind of the, the available technologies will be different. Uh, probably what I can say is that uh, to be specific, we need to have a bit more knowledge about you know, the properties of the wastewater and what standards we have to meet. Is the treated wastewater, for example, going to be released to river or it can be released to an agricultural, let's say land uh, for you know, human use or animal use. It, it would be nice if you can send me an email and we can kind of connect and have a conversation, a bit more specific conversation, what kind of wastewater and what kind of end use we have in mind and probably we can relate to some of the research projects uh, that are going on in my university and also your university to see really what might be the best solution. Thank so you, if Dr. you can Sultan. send me an, an, an email, uh, my email is j.sultan, I can, I can type it in the chat and I would be glad to have a conversation about this issue. Thank you, Dr. Sultan. I would like to, um, there's a lot of questions that have come in the past few minutes, so I'm just trying to uh, mix it up. So this question is for Dr. Willinir from Amaya Pass. Are the processes that are currently being used in Chilean wa wastewater treatment plants that solve the problem of emerging pollutants or micropollutants such as ozonation, such as the ones that Dr. Jafar Sultan mentioned? So nation is, is, is used, but with another another goal. Normally it's used for kill um, bacteria or reduce the quantity of uh, organism in order to um, uh, in order to get a, a better quality of water. I am not sure if there are some measurements about the removal of micropollutants. So uh, it must be studied, I think, and I'm sure that the people in utilities are studying this important aspect. 
So yes, they are using some uh, advanced oxidation process, but in order to reduce the quantity of uh, microorganisms that are pathogens. Yes, it is. Yes, I hope that question was correctly addressed. Um, let me just go to the next question. This question is for um, Dr. Sultan, which is a perspective of the AOP technology to use it in commercial and industrial scale in the future, more especially in developing countries. So which would be the main barriers to achieve this stage uh, regarding cost, technology development and others consider? Uh, I tell you that these barriers are correct, they exist and they exist for everybody. So at different uh, you know, conditions, uh, because really what I presented and what people are writing in their papers and publishing, these are mostly research programs, really uh, before we can go out and say, okay, I have an advanced oxidation process to take care of these emerging pollutants. Before doing that, we have to have a lot of answers to a lot of questions because typically a lot of this research is done in clean water with one pollutant or maybe a couple of pollutants. We have to see what happens if you apply this technology in real wastewater? Is there a risk that you may produce a toxic byproduct that is even more harmful than the starting material? So in that regards, we are all in the same situation. We are doing research and we are, we are trying to answer these questions one by one before being able to uh, claim that we have a technology. So if you are interested, again, welcome welcome uh, to the club. We are all interested and we want to do research. Uh, as I sent my, my email, you know, tell me what specific pollutant you are interested or you are working on. Maybe we can share ideas and, and we can collaborate. But really we don't have a technology available yet. We don't have in Canada, I'm sure that we don't have in Chile or even other countries. There are some countries that have some limited application, mm -hmm. uh, but again, they are very limited. We don't have an established technology that you can safely go and apply and be sure that it is addressing the problem. It is not causing trouble. So we are all kind of curious and, and we are working to the same goal of doing research and developing technology. Thank you, Dr. Sultan. I see Dr. Willinir has been addressing some of the questions in the chat. Some question, yes. Um, there are some, let me see. Um, pop, 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 pop. Uh, well, uh, some question I answered uh, directly to the the people who asked, but um, mm -hmm. so uh, but I would like to ask something to my colleague Sultan. Can I? No. Sure, please. You 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 uh, you said something about selective absorbent of antibiotics. So if you have this material with the antibiotics, uh, what will you? You, what would you do with these uh, compounds? I mean, this uh, absorbent can be saturated, and then what? What can you do with with this? Yeah, that that is an interesting point. Basically, the problem is typically we have a large mass of wastewater that has, let's say, antibiotics in it. Now, if you can use an adsorbent to kind of to remove these or to remove a lot of these antibiotics, then you can take this adsorbent and for example, burn it. Because you are really, the whole issue is to prevent the release of these chemicals into nature. Yep. 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 Uh, so somehow you have to catch them and do something about them. So I would say 
burdening would be easy, but maybe we can find another way to deal with them. We, we did some tests with, for example, using advanced oxidation to, uh, to degrade these antibiotics, to break them. But again, it becomes the issue of cost because you know yes. how much it costs to make this and this uh, adsorbent, and how much it costs to uh, utilize ozone, and really what is more economically reasonable. The whole idea is just to prevent them from going to nature. Then, if you collect them in one place, you have more options to deal with them. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, thank you. you. Yes, thank you, both of them. Uh, more research, actually, now that you mention it, is being done also. Dr. Sultan is probably familiar with uh, Dr. Dalai's um, research group, also in the chemical engineering department. Um, the issue that you were addressing, Dr. Cesar, was what do you do after you remove these uh, pollutants when they're already in your material. So that was actually part of um, the research that I did for my master's. Um, one of the um, <clears throat> options for, you know, what to do with these pollutants or contaminants after they've been removed is the recovery process that has been addressed with uh, mild organic solvents. Uh, I did a Soxlex extraction to remove, in my case, was sulfur and nitrogen. And uh, well, obviously, that will be uh, something to look um, into it as well. What can you do with that sulfur and nitrogen after you remove it? So there's also different types of uh, recovery processes if your target is to actually recover those contaminants. And like Dr. Sultan mentioned, there's also you can just combust them or you can uh, dispose of them. Uh, there's other uh, type of, um, I guess, processes that can be done further. But if the material that you're removing is or it can actually be of value, then it's definitely something to be worth to look into. We have a question from, <laughs> there's just so many questions I'm trying to. Um, you already, um, answer the absorption of antibiotics. We already discussed that. Um, the Chilean water as well. Um, let me see from the chat here. It's just so many questions from everywhere. I'm sorry. Uh, okay, so okay. this one is for Dr. Uh, let's go for Dr. Willie Near. How far is Chile from achieving a technology to remove emerging pollutants and to apply them to the wastewater treatment process? And is there any country currently applying technologies to treat them or are they still on research? No, is it still in research, I think, in Chile or in any, any part of the world? Um, <clears throat> the, 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 well, I think the problem, not all, technic technically you can, you can, of course. AOPS, even, even in, through biological processes, you can uh, reduce the the concentration, but uh, I think the main problem could be the norm. Uh, in norm, norm, it's uh, crucial in order to reduce subcompounds. And if the um, if the normative or the norms about the discharge in, uh, in body waters doesn't have take into account these uh, compounds, probably utilities mm -hmm. or or industrial uh, will not be interested in, in, in reduce or remove this compound. So technically the, the, the technology is available, but uh, the, the charm or the, the real effect on the industry probably uh, will come from the, the politics and governments in order to introduce these compounds in the normative the norm. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Cesar. Uh, it seems that someone from the public was raising their hand. So I think we're going to just give them the chance to answer. Oh, sorry, to ask their question to you. Uh, 
I think that the, your microphone needs mute. Is it Christian that's the one that wants to ask the question? Christian, he... no te escuchamos. Ah, Chris, sorry, Christian, <laughs> we cannot hear you. Hi, are you heard? Yes. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Uh, Mohamed Sadeh and Dr. Linier. I will share your, your time. Uh, I would like to know what about was water treatment plants in Canada about uh, their kind of treatment uh, there the these uh, was water treatment plants also remove um, nutrients or mainly organic matters dissolve BOT. Thank you very much. Uh, yeah, I, I think the question was uh, about wastewater treatment plants and do they remove these, for example, phosphorus and nitrogen or they just uh, remove BOD? Uh, there are a lot of plants with different processes. As far as I know, for example, the wastewater treatment plant in Vancouver uh, a few years ago has installed uh, this phosphorus and nitrogen removal uh, addition in their system. In Saskatoon also, a couple of years ago, I know that they had started uh, adding this uh, unit to the wastewater treatment plant to remove these chemicals in addition to traditional BOD removal. At this stage, I am not aware if they have started using the system or not. But I remember a couple of years ago, there was conversation about you know the, the right bidding and finding the right company to install that addition in the wastewater treatment plant. But of course, it really depends on the economy. And uh, because in, in Canada, wastewater treatment plant falls under uh, the municipal government. So really depends on each community what they want to do and how much cost or how much benefit they want to accept for a specific unit. Thank you very much. Thank you. Yes, thank you. We just, we're just moving forward here. I think we have um, time for no, more, one or two more questions. So this one is from Dr. Willie Neer. Uh, what do you think about the recovery of magnesium from seawater, like the diesel, desalination brines and its potential application to strawberry recovery? Oh, very good question. Um, well, we, we need to try it, of course. Um, I am not sure if maybe it's the first time that I hear about the, the possibility of uh, use it. And it could be a very interesting way to uh, recover magnesium from some kind of waste. Um, well, it's a good idea. It's a good idea. I don't know if someone else is working on, but probably in the future could be uh, an interesting uh, source of magnesium and then uh, uh, produce the estrobite with uh, other kind of waste. So yeah, it could be a good idea. It sounds very interesting. interesting. Yes, now we're moving into a kind of a um, epidemic question regarding water treatment. So I'm just gonna read it to you. Mm -hmm. SARS-CoV-2, or the RNA virus of 120 nanometer in size, is the causative agent of the COVID-19 disease and is eliminated in wastewater by a person by the third day after infection. It is postulated that they are inactive particles, but this has yet be to, be, to be demonstrated. Is there a proposed urban wastewater treatment technology for removing these particles? This was from Homero Urrutia. 
Oh, I couldn't, I couldn't understand very well. Let me see. Ah, here. It Oh, well, um, um, I don't know really. Uh, it, it is possible that there are inactive particles, but this has yet to be demonstrated, as uh, Dr. Romero Rutia says. But I am not sure about some technology for remove these particles. Um, so I don't know. Yeah, I, I would say this is a very interesting topic. And, and the point is really we are dealing with a situation that is quite you know, hot and, and current. I don't think that there is an established technology for this yet, but probably this is something that you know, people should do research and work on because it seems that we will be dealing with this virus for a, or its different variations for a while. So yeah, I'm not aware of any technology that exists, but probably this is a good area for research to see if there is a solution uh, for this problem. Yep. Yes, I guess that's an, a research area that would probably emerge in the next couple of months or years. <laughs> exactly. A couple of months, yes. Uh, I think that I've covered all the questions that we've had. <clears throat> I don't know if anybody has any more questions that would like to ask Drs. Willie and Sultan. If not, am, then... Um... Oh, and if you have any remarks to add, of course, please feel free. I am trying to read it. Uh, no. I think the last one was from Gonzalo Norambuena, and uh, I think that was uh, answered. So, no, I think no. Dr. Sultan, you have any? No, other I, I don't comments? have. A any any comment i just wanted to thank our participants for very insightful questions really some of these questions uh, are very interesting to think about and that really speaks to the high quality of the expertise and wide range of interests from our participants i really wanted to thank you and i'm hoping that at some stage we can meet in person have a coffee and I'm sure that we will have wonderful conversation with the kind of uh, response and questions that I'm seeing from the panel. So I wanted to thank our participants and I wanted to thank uh, our, our hosts, really um, our colleagues uh, in the University of Santiago did a wonderful job in organizing this meeting. And I want to thank Anna Karen from yes. her, uh, for her really willingness to help she is a proud recent graduate of our program, and she was very kind to offer to give us her time and her expertise. She is speaking two wonderful languages. And, and at some stage, I hope I can learn some Spanish uh, to say the basic words, but really, Anna was, was a real lifesaver. Thank you. Well, thank you, doctors, for having me and everybody that attended. This is yes. a great opportunity to just expand our network, right? It's just very um, rewarding to be able to be a graduate from the University of Saskatchewan and also have the reach to do collaborations like this with universities in Latin America. That for me is just very much of value. I'm from Mexico, so it's just really nice to see the collaboration here. Thank you. Thank you. And uh, thank you also for all the people who asked very interesting questions, um, very advanced questions, I think. And um, if the, the answers were not too much uh, uh, deep, so sorry, but uh, uh, I think uh, um, 
this opportunity is for growth, everyone. So thanks again for the, 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 the questions and the panelists, of course, the Dr. Sultan for presentation and uh, Anna Karen and all the team in, in the University of Santiago de Chile as well. Thank you. Just to add, I think we, we will have to do a second part because of the popularity of, of the yes. topic. So <laughs> we have to reverse something. So just from the, the international office, thank you to our panelists, Professor Sultan, Professor Willinir. Also, thank you, Anna, Anna Karen, for your great moderation. Thank yes. you. And thank you all uh, for your attention and active participation. Uh, we hope to see you again soon in another webinar. So bye bye. Thank you. Bye. <laughs> Bye. See you soon. Thank you. Yeah. Have a good day. Bye. Thanks. Have a good day. Bye. You too.